If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Peggy Cox clutched a single penny in her hand as she opened the window that held back the chill night air. The mother of three was working the late shift at the Hardee's in Franklin, Tennessee. Just moments earlier, a voice had crackled through the restaurant's drive through intercom. A man's voice. Peggy took his order. A roast beef sandwich for $2.99. Peggy's 20-year-old son, Jude, set about fixing the meal in the eatery's kitchen. Peggy picked up a penny and prepared to give the late-night customer his food and change. The date was February 1st, 1991. Not just another ordinary day for Peggy. It was her 49th birthday. Peggy's family had celebrated the day before to accommodate her work schedule. The start of February could be melancholy for the Cox family. The anniversary of Peggy's husband's death was just a few days away. But now, Peggy had both her kids and her new work friends at Hardy's to help her feel less alone. She wasn't an outgoing woman, but she was beloved by those who knew her. Then, with just 15 minutes to go till that wintry midnight, she was taken away from all of that, forever. Peggy opened the window to tend to the customer. Two gunshots rang out. One shot hit Peggy in the neck as she turned away from the window. The bullet pierced her brainstem. Jude watched his mother collapse to the floor. He crawled to her side. Another employee phoned the police. Here's audio of the 911 call courtesy of the FBI's official YouTube account. Sir, is anybody shot? Yes, uh, yes sir, somebody shot. Uh, uh, drive through parking at the window. First responders rushed Peggy to the hospital, but there was nothing that could be done for her. She died, leaving behind a devastated family, a shattered community, and a single anguished question. Who could have done this? My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, The Murder Sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout Season 1 to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're The Murder Sheet, and this is 
The Murder of Peggy Cox, Part 1. In true crime media, words like heinous and heartbreaking get thrown around a lot. And that's understandable. Murder, especially cold-blooded, premeditated homicide, is in itself heinous. And the results of such a crime, the grief that loved ones are left with, the tragedy of a life cut short, are indeed heartbreaking. But there's something about the murder of Peggy Cox that seems sad and upsetting beyond words. Look up a picture of this woman. She's got a big smile, brown hair, and these enormous retro glasses. She looks like she could be your friend's mom or somebody you might meet through church or at a business in your community. And of course, she was all of those things. This is the first of two episodes we'll be dedicating to Peggy's case. This week, we're getting to who Peggy was. We're talking about the area where this crime occurred. And we're talking about what happened that terrible night. Next week, we'll get more into the actual investigation, the various leads that have fizzled out over time. One of the reasons that this case remains so baffling is that there's no obvious suspect. Peggy Cox was not the kind of person to make enemies. Here's her eldest daughter, Desiree, who was 23 when the murder happened. She was very nice, but she was uh, very passive. She wasn't, you know, so vocal or anything. By 1991, Peggy and her children had already been through a major tragedy. In 1973, my dad had a car wreck, and he suffered head injury. So he was left in a... A comatose condition, I guess you would call it. So my mother had opted to bring him home and care for him at home. So that's what she spent most of her time doing was caring for him and, you know, running after, you know, us kids. In 83, I was 15, he he had died as a result of those uh, injuries from the car wreck. Peggy's kids became concerned about their mother. They wanted her to have a life outside the home. And that's how we had talked her into working with us at Hardy's. And because the only other thing she ever did was she went to church on Sundays and laundromat was like on Tuesdays. And then I think Wednesday was grocery store day or something. And occasionally help her sister look after her dad. But I mean, that's all she did. She didn't have a lot going on. So that's why we had gotten tried to get her, start getting her out of the house more by getting her to work. And Hardy's was an obvious choice for Peggy. Her children, Desiree and Jude, already worked at the fast food restaurant. Here's a quick side note. Many of you follow our ongoing miniseries, You Never Can Forget, which looks at Indiana's Burger Chef murders. Most Burger Chef locations changed into Hardy's restaurants after Amasco Limited bought the two chains in the early 80s. By the time she was murdered, I had um, found a job somewhere else. So I was working a full-time job somewhere else, and she was still she was still over there working with uh, my brother. Peggy started out working during the day at Hardy's and was put in charge of fixing salads. Over time, she started to take on more evening shifts, as she'd often drive her son Jude to the restaurant then. And people at the Hardys liked Peggy. You know, she had gained a lot of friends down there, too. Some of the other ladies, some of the ladies in management and stuff, they were all kind of friends. And they had gone out to celebrate somebody's birthday uh, not long before that or something. 
anyway, um, or I didn't realize until after the fact that we had a lot of people that we had got, uh, like me and my sister went to school with that would go through the drive through because my mom was working there. They liked that she was friendly and they liked to talk to her. So sometimes my mom would be running the drive through in the morning and sometimes she'd be running it at night. It just depended on what they needed. But she wasn't necessarily planning to stay at Hardy's forever. The restaurant was situated just off Interstate 65 in Franklin, Tennessee. Being so close to a major road meant that things could get pretty busy at that Hardy's. It wasn't the ideal job. That's kind of why I left after a few years. And I was actually getting my mom interested in changing jobs because I had gone, they had opened a Kmart not far from there, and I had gone to work over there. And uh, she was interested in going to work over there. But I didn't get her, ch- I, you know, she didn't get to change jobs uh, soon enough. For all you folks who are like us and not super familiar with the area around Music City, we'd like to give you a better picture of what exactly this region of Tennessee is like. The Cox family lived in Thompson Station, a town in Williamson County. Back when Desiree and her siblings were growing up, That was a pretty quiet place. They were on one of the longest bus routes. Nowadays, the area is much busier. Especially Franklin, a major city in the Nashville metro area, where the Hardee's was located. Here's Jim East, who lives in Franklin. He's an experienced journalist who covered the Cox case in depth for the Tennessean. We'll hear more from him in our next episode. But for now... Here's his description of Franklin and Williamson County. Not a very big place, but a historic place. We're about 15 miles from Nashville and a lot of Civil War sites and battlefields and that kind of thing. And Williamson County was settled in 1799, so it's an old um, county and city. And Franklin is a county seat. Williamson is the wealthiest county in Tennessee. A lot of um, artists and celebrities live here. Keith Urban and Nicole Kidman and, you know, Dolly Parton. It's growing now. It's probably about 90,000, maybe 100,000 people now. Back then it was 50 or 60,000. Now, it's important to keep in mind that this area of Tennessee was not crime-ridden in 1991. It had occasional murder, nothing really infamous. You know, man kills his wife or vice versa or uh, some card game or whatever, you know, some robbery. Um, but uh, the I-65 murder... Uh, Peggy's murder was unusual just because of the way it happened, the way it apparently happened. Still, the region's roadways can inadvertently aid criminals. I mean, that's one thing the police were saying then. It, you know, and since then, just the way Nashville has the three interstates that cross right there, uh, it's perfect for people to get away with that, you know, stealing cars and all kinds of stuff because they can just hit the interstate and they're gone. Because um, they can be on I-65, 24, or uh, 40, you know, and then out of here. So they had a lot of problems with car theft there for a while and stuff. So because you can get away faster. Of course. I-65 in particular would play a major role in the events of February 1st, 1991. The interstate runs from Mobile, Alabama to Gary, Indiana. I-65 enters Tennessee from Alabama and hits Franklin on the way north into Nashville. From there, it continues on into Kentucky. That's the road that Peggy's killer would speed off onto that night in February. Desiree spoke to us about that Friday. She had gone to a party at the apartment across from her sister Rachel's residence, not far from the Hardys. One of my uh, new co-workers over at Kmart 
had an apartment over there. And one of the girls that we worked with were, she was moving the next day back to California. So we were having a going away party for her or get together, I guess you would say in the apartment across the hall from my sister. And actually we were getting about ready to leave the, the party when we heard a commotion across the hall and the door slam and everything. And the, the thing is, is my sister and her uh, boyfriend did not know I was across the hall at the time. And I remember hearing them take off because they weren't five minutes from Hardy's. And it wasn't 10 or 15 minutes later, there was a knock on the door and it was actually my sister's boyfriend's father because he was a Brentwood, off-duty Brentwood police officer and they had gotten a hold of him. I don't know how, but I guess his son, my sister's boyfriend called him. Word was already spreading fast about what had happened at the Hardys. But they had tracked me down through my boyfriend that I was dating that night. His mother knew, knew that where we had gone to a party and my sister and her, that they were like, that was across the hall. So anyway, they had sent him over there to get me um, that night. So... That was uh, really weird. The off-duty officer told Desiree that her mother had been shot. Yeah, and I've only spoke to the girl that moved to California a handful of times, and um, she she said she's still horrified by the look on my face when they told me that. Um, but you know, I I remember him telling. I mean, because that's your worst nightmare is to be. You know, at that point, I mean, I was 23, but I was technically, you know, I'm an adult orphan. I don't have any parents anymore, you know. Desiree's sister, Rachel, who was just 21 then, was already at the Hardee's at that point. Because my sister got to got to Hardee's before they got my mother out of there. Because the interstate, um, <laughs> There's so we're all right out there at the interstate, and the hospital was on the other side of I-65. So it was just less than a five-minute little across there. And the apartment that we apartments she was at were just around the corner. So it was just like all right there. It was really wild. I didn't know for years later that she had got there before um, they had taken my mom out of there. In a 2017 video posted on the City of Franklin's YouTube page, Rachel said her boyfriend had answered the call about the shooting. He'd gotten confused and told her that her aunt had been shot at the Hardee's. When the couple made it to the restaurant, they saw Jude surrounded by police. He was having trouble speaking and clutching bloody glasses in his hands. Rachel recognized the glasses as her mother's. That night, the Cox sisters learned the details about the brutal attack on their mother. The shooter had never said anything about robbing the store, at least not anything audible to the other employees. Jude has been reluctant to talk to the media for a number of years now. That's very understandable in our view. He lived through an unimaginably traumatic situation. He has also had to sit through a number of interviews where the journalist involved ended up butchering the details of his mother's story, including her name. But Desiree filled us in on what else Jude shared about what happened that night. Um, he had re- he had um, gone over there to her. Um, I'm not sure if he knows what all he or remembers what all you know, what all happened there or whatever. I don't know what all he remembers. Um, He's not big on talking to us or telling us a lot about what he, what he knows or what he remembers. Um, It was discussed at one point, maybe hypnotizing him, but then we never did that. So Um, I know he says he thought she was trying to say something, but um. Yeah, from some of those crime shows and stuff I've been watching, uh, 
the ones on uh whatever discovery id and all that mess um in one of them i was watching that had a similar uh, uh it was shot similar to how my mom was it seems like what they were saying was it, because of the adrenaline and everything whatever you were doing when it happened it's what your body's going to keep doing because it doesn't know yet that you're dead <laughs> And because this guy apparently had kept running up underneath something, and they didn't know how he got that far up under there. And they were like, well, it's because, you know, the signal from his brain hadn't got to the rest of his body that to say, Shh, you know, stop it. <laughs> um, because of the, because he was in, he was running, you know, because somebody was shooting at him and chasing him or something. Wow. So, um, Whatever she was probably trying to say or whatever, when she left the window, like she was going to say something to him then or something, that's probably whatever she was trying to finish saying or whatever. I don't know. Um, he doesn't elaborate much on that. Something I've, you know, I don't ask him too much about it, but sometimes I'll try to get him on the subject. He hasn't. He doesn't say a lot about it. Here are some more details we can fill you in on. Witnesses spotted a vehicle speeding away from the restaurant. It was heading north on I-65 and has been described as a compact car. The gun used in this crime has been called small caliber. Both the Franklin police and the FBI declined to speak with us for the show. But Franklin Police Lieutenant Charles Warner directed us to a statement from Police Chief Deborah Faulkner. Peggy Cox and her family deserve justice. We will never stop hunting for her killer or the answers that Peggy's family and our community deserve. Immediately after the shooting, Peggy was rushed to the Williamson Medical Center. Desiree later learned more about her mother's last moments from an acquaintance who happened to be there. Then I just found out the other day that a friend of my sister's, a girl that I know, well, I know the girl, but she's my sister's friend. Um, she had actually been in the emergency room suffering from, they they had nicked her spine or something during an epidural, and she was partially paralyzed. And she didn't know at the time that that was our mother that they had brought in. She was in the emergency room, and she heard them trying to, uh, you know, doing life-saving measures or whatever. Um that was interesting that it, I didn't know that she was in there at the time. Two, the type I found out too, the type of injury she had, because um, she, she was actually shot once right through the brain stem. That technically she was she was gone before she hit the floor, because when you're shot through the brain stem, that pretty much all fun, all you know yeah. functions cease at that point. But, it, I mean, I appreciate the fact that they attempted to to help her, right? you know, right. even though, I, you know, it turned out that it, it wasn't because they didn't try, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. In the aftermath of the shooting, Desiree said her thoughts returned to painful memories of her father's last years. Yeah, and being that, and this sounds strange, um, so her father had had a head injury in that car wreck. So that left him, you know, kind of messed up. And we all, in the moment we were talking later, my mom's sisters and, you know, us kids and stuff. And the first thing that, you know, when we found out she had been shot, we were like, Oh Lord, we didn't want her to be left in a condition like he was. So, I mean, you know, it sounded really weird, but, um, we weren't grateful that she died, but we were grateful she wasn't left in, uh, you know, in a uh, comatose condition. Um, that's no way to be. So it was a really weird evening. And I guess if you haven't been in a situation like that, you don't understand it <laughs> so much. We didn't want her dead, but we didn't want her in that shape either. So, But there would be no long lingering death to contend with. Peggy Cox passed away in the hospital, despite the very best efforts of the medical staff. She was a mother of three 
who is close to her children. She was a quiet woman who still seemed to touch those around her, attracting all sorts of friends through her work at the Hardys. She was the kind of person with the fortitude to care for her husband at home throughout his coma. It seems so appalling that something like this could happen, and that all these years later, answers remain elusive for those who loved Peggy Cox. Please, if you have any information on Peggy Cox's murder, call the Franklin Police tip line at 615-550-8404 or text 615-FPD along with your tip to 847411. There is a $25,000 reward in this case. Next week, we'll continue our conversation with Desiree about her mother's case. We'll also hear a lot more from Jim East, a journalist who covered this still unsolved crime from the jump. And we'll get into some theories. Special thanks to Desiree and Jim for talking with us. Thanks to Lieutenant Charles Warner of the Franklin PD. Our hearts go out to everyone who loved Peggy Cox. For this episode, we relied on interviews with Desiree Cox and Jim East. We'll include links to videos about the murder from YouTube accounts belonging to the city of Franklin and the FBI. Articles from the Tennessean, the Spring Hill homepage, WKRN, and News Channel 5 Nashville were also helpful. We'll link to all of those in our show notes. I first heard about the case through the YouTube account Heavy Case Files, which published an interesting video about fast food homicides that I'll also link to. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet and on Facebook at MSheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.